and the allied industries and professions. Today, opportunity is open before the factory worker in his line. It is open before the businessman who supplies the farmer more than before the one who supplies the factory worker, and before the professional man who waits upon the farmer more than before the one who serves the working class. There is an abundance of opportunity for the man who will go with the tide instead of trying to swim against it. So the factory workers, either as individuals or as a class, are not deprived of opportunity. The workers are not being kept down by their masters. They are not being ground by the trusts and combinations of capital. As a class, they are where they are because they do not do things in a certain way. If the workers of America chose to do so, they could follow the example of their brothers in Belgium and other countries and establish great department stores and cooperative industries. They could elect men of their own class to office and pass laws favoring the development of such cooperative industries, and in a few years they could take peaceable possession of the industrial field. The working class may become the master class whenever they will begin to do things in a certain way. The law of wealth is the same for them as it is for all others. This they must learn, and they will remain where they are as long as they continue to do as they do. The individual worker, however, is not held down by the ignorance or the mental slothfulness of his class. He can follow the tide of opportunity to riches, and this book will tell him how. No one is kept in poverty by a shortness in the supply of riches. There is more than enough for all. A palace as large as the Capitol in Washington might be built for every family on earth from the building material in the United States alone, and under intensive cultivation, this country would produce wool, cotton, linen, and silk enough to clothe each person in the world finer than Solomon was arrayed in all his glory, together with food enough to feed them all luxuriously. The visible supply is practically inexhaustible, and the invisible supply really is inexhaustible. Everything you see on earth is made from one original substance, out of which all things proceed. New forms are constantly being made, and older ones are dissolving but all are shapes assumed by one thing. There is no limit to the supply of formless stuff or original substance. The universe is made out of it, but it was not all used in making the universe. The spaces in, through, and between the forms of the visible universe are permeated and filled with the original substance, with the formless stuff, with the raw material of all things. Ten thousand times as much has been made might still be made, and even then we should not have exhausted the supply of universal raw material. No man, therefore, is poor because nature is poor, or because there is not enough to go around. Nature is an inexhaustible storehouse of riches. The supply will never run short. Original substance is alive with creative energy and is constantly producing more forms. When the supply of building material is exhausted, more will be produced. When the soil is exhausted so that foodstuffs and materials for clothing will no longer grow upon it, it will be renewed or more soil will be made. When all the gold and silver has been dug from the earth, if man is still in such a stage of social development that he needs gold and silver, more will be produced from the formless. The formless stuff responds to the needs of man. It will not let him be without any good thing. This is true of man collectively. The race as a whole is always abundantly rich. And if individuals are poor, it is because they do not follow the certain way of doing things which makes the individual man rich. The formless stuff is intelligent. It is stuff which thinks. It is alive and is always impelled towards more life. It is the natural and inherent impulse of life to seek to live more. It is the nature of intelligence to enlarge itself, and of consciousness to seek to extend its boundaries and find fuller expression. The universe of forms has been made by formless living substance, throwing itself into form in order to express itself more fully. The universe is a great living presence, always moving inherently towards more life and fuller functioning. Nature is formed for the advancement of life. Its impelling motive is the increase of life. For this cause, everything which can possibly minister to life is bountifully provided. There can be no lack unless God is to contradict himself and nullify his own works. You are not kept poor by lack in the supply of riches. It is a fact which I shall demonstrate a little further on, that even the resources of the formless supply are at the command of the man or woman who will act and think in a certain way. Chapter 4. The First Principle in the Science of Getting Rich 
Thought is the only power which can produce tangible riches from the formless substance. The stuff from which all things are made is a substance which thinks, and a thought of form in this substance produces the form. Original substance moves according to its thought. Every form and process you see in nature is the visible expression of a thought in original substance. As the formless stuff thinks of a form, it takes that form. As it thinks of a motion, it makes that motion. That is the way all things were created. We live in a thought world, which is part of a thought universe. The thought of a moving universe extended through formless substance, and the thinking stuff moving according to that thought, took the form of systems of planets and maintains that form. Thinking substance takes the form of its thought and moves according to that thought. Holding the idea of a circling system of suns and worlds, it takes the form of these bodies and moves them as it thinks. Thinking the form of a slow-growing oak tree, it moves accordingly and produces the tree, though centuries may be required to do the work. In creating, the formless seems to move according to the lines of motion it has established. The thought of an oak tree does not cause the instant formation of a full-grown tree, but it does start in motion the forces which will produce the tree along established lines of growth. Every thought of form held in thinking substance causes the creation of the form, but always, or at least generally, along lines of growth and action already established. The thought of a house of a certain construction, if it were impressed upon formless substance, might not cause the instant formation of the house, but it would cause the turning of creative energies already working in trade and commerce into such channels as to result in the speedy building of the house. And if there were no existing channels through which the creative energy could work, then the house would be formed directly from primal substance, without waiting for the slow processes of the organic and inorganic world. No thought of form can be impressed upon original substance without causing the creation of the form. Man is a thinking center and can originate thought. All the forms that man fashions with his hands must first exist in his thought. He cannot shape a thing until he has thought that thing. And so far, man has confined his efforts wholly to the work of his hands. He has applied manual labor to the world of forms, seeking to change or modify those already existing. He has never thought of trying to cause the creation of new forms by impressing his thoughts upon formless substance. When man has a thought form, he takes material from the forms of nature and makes an image of the form which is in his mind. He has so far made little or no effort to cooperate with formless intelligence, to work with the Father. He has not dreamed that he can do what he seeth the Father doing. Man reshapes and modifies existing forms by manual labor. He has given no attention to the question whether he may not produce things from formless substance by communicating his thoughts to it. We propose to prove that he may do so, to prove that any man or woman may do so, and to show how. As our first step, we must lay down the three fundamental propositions. First, we assert that there is one original formless stuff, or substance, from which all things are made. All the seemingly many elements are but different presentations of one element. All the many forms found in organic and inorganic nature are but different shapes made from the same stuff. And this stuff is thinking stuff. A thought held in it produces the form of the thought. Thought, in thinking substance, produces shapes. Man is a thinking center, capable of original thought. If a man can communicate his thought to original thinking substance, he can cause the creation or formation of the thing he thinks about. To summarize this, there is a thinking stuff from which all things are made, and which, in its original state, permeates, penetrates, and fills the interspaces of the universe. A thought in this substance produces the thing that is imaged by the thought. Man can form things in his thought and, by impressing his thought upon formless substance, can cause the thing he thinks about to be created. It may be asked if I can prove these statements, and without going into details, I answer that I can do so both by logic and experience. Reasoning back from the phenomena of form and thought, I come to one original thinking substance, and reasoning forward from that thinking substance, I come to man's power to cause the formation of the thing he thinks about. And by experiment, I find the reasoning true. And this is my strongest proof. If one man who reads this book gets rich by doing what it tells him to do, that is evidence in support of my claim. 
But if every man who does what it tells him to do gets rich, that is proof positive until someone goes through the process and fails. The theory is true until the process fails, and this process will not fail. For every man who does exactly what this book tells him to do will get rich. I have said that men get rich by doing things in a certain way. And in order to do so, men must become able to think in a certain way. A man's way of doing things is the direct result of the way he thinks about things. To do things in a way that you want to do them, you will have to acquire the ability to think the way you want to think. This is the first step towards getting rich. To think what you want to think is to think truth, regardless of appearances. Every man has the natural and inherent power to think what he wants to think, but it requires far more effort to do so than it does to think the thoughts which are suggested by appearances. To think according to appearance is easy. To think truth regardless of appearances is laborious and requires the expenditure of more power than any other work man is called upon to perform. There is no labor from which most people shrink as they do from that of sustained and consecutive thought. It is the hardest work in the world. This is especially true when truth is contrary to appearances. Every appearance in the visible world tends to produce a corresponding form in the mind which observes it, and this can only be prevented by holding the thought of the truth. To look upon the appearance of disease will produce the form of disease in your own mind and ultimately in your body. Unless you hold the thought of the truth, which is that there is no disease, it is only an appearance, and the reality is health. To look upon the appearances of poverty will produce corresponding forms in your own mind. Unless you hold to the truth that there is no poverty, there is only abundance. To think health when surrounded by the appearance of disease, or to think riches when in the midst of appearances of poverty, requires power. But he who acquires this power becomes a master mind. He can conquer fate. He can have what he wants. This power can only be acquired by getting hold of the basic fact which is behind all appearances. And that fact is that there is one thinking substance, from which and by which all things are made. Then we must grasp the truth that every thought held in this substance becomes a form, and that man can so impress his thoughts upon it as to cause them to take form and become visible things. When we realize this, we lose all doubt and fear, for we know that we can create what we want to create, and we can get what we want to have, and can become what we want to be. As a first step towards getting rich, you must believe the three fundamental statements given previously in this chapter, and in order to emphasize them, I repeat them here. There is a thinking stuff from which all things are made, and which, in its original state, permeates, penetrates, and fills the interspaces of the universe. A thought in this substance produces the thing that is imaged by the thought. Man can form things in his thought, and, by impressing his thought upon formless substance, can cause the thing he thinks about to be created. You must lay aside all of the concepts of the universe than this monistic one, and you must dwell upon this until it is fixed in your mind and has become your habitual thought. Read these creed statements over and over again. Fix every word upon your memory, and meditate upon them until you firmly believe what they say. If a doubt comes to you, cast it aside as a sin. Do not listen to arguments against this idea. Do not go to churches or lectures where a contrary concept of things is taught or preached. Do not read magazines or books which teach a different idea. If you get mixed up in your faith, all your efforts will be in vain. Do not ask why these things are true, nor speculate as to how they can be true. Simply take them on trust. The science of getting rich begins with the absolute acceptance of this faith. Chapter 5. Increasing Life You must get rid of the last vestige of the old idea that there is a deity whose will it is that you should be poor, or whose purposes may be served by keeping you in poverty. The intelligent substance which is all, and in all, which lives in all and lives in you, 
is a consciously living substance. Being a consciously living substance, it must have the nature and inherent desire of every living intelligence for increase of life. Every living thing must continually seek for the enlargement of its life, because life, in the mere act of living, must increase itself. A seed, dropped into the ground, springs into activity, and in the act of living produces a hundred more seeds. Life, by living, multiplies itself. It is forever becoming more. It must do so if it continues to be at all. Intelligence is under the same necessity for continuous increase. Every thought we think makes it necessary for us to think another thought. Consciousness is continually expanding. Every fact we learn leads us to the learning of another fact. Knowledge is continually increasing. Every talent we cultivate brings to the mind the desire to cultivate another talent. We are subject to the urge of life, seeking expression, which ever drives us on to know more, 